everybody. Um, I thought I'd start by just playing a couple of examples from just short clips from a couple of different projects that I've done, all which deal with different aspects of machine uh, learning. Um, so the first example I'm going to play is um, from a project that will be released next year. Okay, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, the, first part, the first clip that I'll play is from a project that will be released next year. Um, I don't know how many of you studied music and had to study the history of Western music. Do we have anybody studied music at university here? No? Okay. So uh, when you study the history of Western music um, at university, um, they make you learn uh, music from the sort of the ancient Greeks until now. And uh, the students find it total agony um, because it's all vocal music and they find it very difficult to tell the different types of vocal music apart and they can't tell all the different types of Gregorian chants apart and then they can't tell what's a Masho motet, you know, as opposed to a Dufai motet. And so um, having had to teach that and having seen what pain the students were in, and it was also very notable to me that all the music was from voice. Is that almost every piece that you're teaching when you start teaching the history of Western music is a, is a piece from voice. It's also highly constructed in that, you know, the, the canon that you choose to teach music history with is one that you choose. You know, it's, it doesn't necessarily represent all the composers who were alive. It certainly doesn't represent all the music that was written. So um, I was very interested in this in this idea of this story that we tell about Western music and what Western music is. I'm particularly interested in it because I'm Irish and often Irish music is left out of Western music. Do you know, like we're, we're sort of out there to the far west and we sort of drift off the edge of the mainland of Europe or whatever. So, so it's also interesting to me in terms of how we make them, we make, we make history, we write it. Um, so I have been working with these two guys, Databox. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Databox. Uh, you should check out their work. They're two guys, two American young guys, CJ and Zach. And they do a lot of machine learning projects. At the moment they have a, a project on YouTube which is an internal technical death metal generator. So it's, it's like a YouTube page that's been trained on Canadian technical death metal, which apparently is like really good for training machine learning because it's so precise in the drumming that the, 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 the uh, network can pick that up. So you can log on to YouTube and like listen to just this eternal death metal. In fact, maybe we can build it up right now um, very quickly because it's more fun if you see it. Um, Do you want to do something? And they said, yeah, definitely. What do you want to do? 
And I said, well, I have all these solo recordings of my voice. Would you like to train your network on my voice? And they said, yeah, definitely. So I uploaded all these files to the internet. And then, um, let me get my mouse card. I uploaded all these files to the internet. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I got this email which said, Here's a WeTransfer folder, and I downloaded this massive, massive folder that had 841 files in it, um, which sort of show how they train their network. Their network's called Sample or NN. How they trained their network on my voice. There were 40 what they call training epochs. So if you think of them as like 40 different generations, because they train, see what the outputs look like, tweak things, back propagate a little bit, train again. And, and see how it comes the next time. So the very first file they had, the most simple, very first file that the, the system produced was this. So it just goes on like that for a minute. Um, and as a musician, it makes a lot of sense because when you warm up your voice, you start with long notes, you, you know, and you just try to just sing these long notes. So I was like, this makes total sense to me. Um, and by the end of, you know, number 40, it sounded like, it, sorry, the end of Epoch 40, 841 files in, it sounded like this. because in the crudest way, what the network is doing is taking a block of white noise. If you think of white noise as every single frequency in the spectrum, if you're younger than perhaps 30, you will remember the televisions doing that when they were tuned to the channels. Um, and so what these type of networks do is sort of carve away everything in the white noise that isn't what they want. And of course, there's bits that are left over. There's artifacts, which is why it sounds like it's over a crappy phone line. It's also why when you've seen, you know, machine learning, learning generated images, there's maybe there's like two sets of teeth in the person's mouth or something, and that's because the network just leaves a few things in there that it shouldn't be in there. So I took these 841 files that the lad sent me, and I started using them in different contexts. Sometimes I would be doing like a free improvisation set and I would just have them there as a massive pool of material. Um, but then I was sort of very interested in the idea of this of the voice developing at these different generations. Early in the different training generations, I'll see if this one works. Yeah. There was a whole pile of epochs where there was just that high whistle and it made me insane to listen to it. And then finally, when it got over it, it was like a kid finishing being an awful teenager. And, and I was like really happy. I was like, thank God, got rid of that whistle. I hated it so much. It was just stuck in my head. I was like, it's a lot of material because some of these files are five minutes long, you know, to, to listen to it. So what I did was, because I was very interested in the idea of the voice evolving, I thought, okay, I should take these and I should map them on to that history of Western music, you know, where I have like Gregorian chant as my very first file, and then I work my way up over about 1200 years, which is roughly 40 human generations. So I liked this also as I was mapping the, the machine learning generations as the human generations. Um, so I thought I'd play you just a brief clip from this project. It's called A Late Anthology of Early Music. Um, and uh, this is uh, some John Dowland. So this is near the, this is, you know, out of 17 files that I made, this is file number 15. So it's near the end of it, um, when, when things are sort of beginning to finally, gradually come into focus. 
and I played this to friends of mine who are early music fans, and they said, yeah, I can actually recognize it as John Dowland's Flow My Tears, which is completely bizarre. Um, but this gives you sort of an idea of one of the sound worlds that I'm interested in with. Slightly differently in here. So these are sort of terrifying 
because you could be at the airport standing in line of immigration. You know, and they say, no, we're not letting you in, you don't get a visa, and you're not exactly sure what the decisions that were made. You could be denied a mortgage. Or, on a positive, on a positive note, you could go for a scan and be told, okay, we can see this super, super early onset cancer, and we're going to be able to cure it. So what happens in here is crucial. There's sort of two strands of AI. Whenever I ask my students what they understand to be AI, they always say it's a system that learns, you know, it learns from its own experiences and it starts generating answers. That's strictly speaking machine learning. Um, the early version of AI we had is called symbolic AI, it's sometimes called good old fashioned AI. And with that, every single line was coded. A human had thought that decision through. Whereas with this, a lot of this are different weightings which are rejigged. The amount of computations that are made are far beyond what one person can sort of consider. So th these hidden layers are something I'm sort of obsessed with because as an artist, they have the potential to offer me some weird shit up the top at the output that'll like make me learn about the way that I think about AI and make me reconsider choices that I'm making. But on a day-to-day -day basis, in terms of decisions about our lives, they also have the potential to offer, you know, offer up biases. You know, there's a lot of facial recognition AI, which is very, very racist and homophobic and transphobic, for example. So those are important things to check out. Um, but I think I just want to show you down the bottom of here. They, I think it's way down the bottom. So. Yeah, they discovered that wave nets could just make music just as a sort of an offshoot, and it sounds like this. You know, it sounds, it sounds like sort of, you know, classical music. Have you heard that in the background at a restaurant? this Sandra Dieleman, I went to a talk that he gave and he said, you know, we've got the program running and then I just thought, oh, I'll just train it on all the piano music there is on YouTube. You know, which is just like, it's such an offhand comment, you know what I mean? I'll just train it on all the piano music that ever existed on YouTube. And he said, and it turns out that most of what's on YouTube as piano music is Chopin. <laughs> so that's why it sounds like it does. And one of the reasons that I really geek out like, and why I find these papers sort of fascinating is because you find these super weird details like the fact that most of the piano music that's on YouTube is Chopin. Why is that? Do you know, is that because it's sort of emotional and people like it in the background? What's going on with that? The other reason is that these papers, um, these, these, sort of, these sort of examples for me are super interesting. So for example, they give this and they say, as you can hear from the samples below, it results in a kind of babbling where real words are interspersed with made up word-like sounds. So that's completely generated. It's not sampled, it's not processed, it's completely generated. And as a vocalist, I'm like, Give me more of this. So like in the piece last night, I'm trying to copy these with my own voice at certain points in the piece. So I'm like, you know, quoting research papers because I think it's weird. Um, and I think it's interesting. So sort of, when I say that's the last three years, it's because of WaveNets and then the generation of coders who've taken WaveNets and done even cooler stuff with it, like DataBots making sample RNN, which is similar to WaveNets, and also Memo Acton, who's, a, who's an artist and technologist I've worked with, who's like, WaveNets, I've got a better version than that. You, you know, so, so this to me, if I think back to the, 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 if I think back to this sound, I almost feel that this, this artifacty, full, messy, distorted sound is going to—it's going to come to sound like the sound of the last part of the second decade of the 21st century. We're going to listen to it 10 years from now, and things have moved on. We'll be like, "Oh, that's so." I, I tweeted about this. I was like, "The kids will be like, we're ringing Gan Wave now." You, you know, like it'll be something that's fetishized in, in sort of retrospect. 
Um, the most extreme example of that that I've worked on in my own work is this project that I did with Memo Acton um, called Ultra Chunk. Oh no, I'm on the right screen now. So um, it was a project that I did. We premiered it about this time last year. Um, Memo is such a fantastic artist. Um, I think is his name. It's called Memo Acton. So if you're going to check out one artist who does machine learning, I really highly recommend checking out Memo's work. Um, and we both um, were artists and residents at Somerset House Studios in London and we got funding to do this project. And that's another issue, is that we needed funding to do this project because of the computations and the machinery that were involved. So for about a year, I made videos with my webcam um, camera on my computer of myself improvising every day. Um, I often made Zoom recordings because I was traveling if I wanted a better microphone. And then Memo took all of these and he trained, it's a sort of a, it's sort of a system of six different neural networks and he trained this sort of system on all of these videos of me improvising. And then he made this system, we call it Ultra Chunk. And in performance, um, Ultra Chunk is listening to me and Ultra Chunk is taking in fragments of what I'm doing and improvising live. So in the clip I'll show you now, you'll see video documentation. Um, there's a video screen, and what's on the video, I have to really emphasize, it's not processed and it's not sampled, it's generated live. Um, we were getting about 20 frames of video per second and about 44,000 audio samples per second in this performance. I was afraid that the PC was like going to go on fire, you know, because it was just, we, you know, it's not, you can't run it on something like this, you need a proper big Bitcoin rig mining style PC um, to run it on. Um, I was also terrified the whole thing was just going to crash, um, but what Memo what was doing. Um, so the system has fed me, you'll see a little representation at the top of the screen, it looks like a barcode. That's the 100 dimensional hypersphere that the system is making decisions in. So for every grain of sound, it's thinking, where will I go? What path will I follow? Um, and for me, this was a really interesting experience because I hated making the videos. It was awful being alone in a room and just. And, and then as soon as I began to sing with Ultra Chunk, I was like, oh, this is really great because I've got a new body, you know, to sing with. And, and it felt completely natural and not natural at the same time. And that, for me, is completely fascinating. That feeling of what it feels like to be a human, singing with something that's not a human, but it feels good, but it also feels weird, but it also feels natural and then not natural. And that texture of that emotion, I'm presuming there's a German word which captures it. You know, um, unheimlich, nicht unheimlich, heimlich, unheimlich, or something like that. Um, but but uh, I was very interested in that feeling. And, and also, the overall result felt like just playing with a regular free improviser. That at times you know they're listening closely to you, at times they're sort of doing their own thing, at times you check in together. So I'll just play you a couple of minutes of this. Um, and like I said, everything that's on the video screen um, in the documentation, the sound, the image is being generated live. It's, it's so, that system is literally painting, you know, 20 frames a second and deciding what they're going to look like. But the only thing that that system has ever seen is me. So in the same way that a kid that grows up in, you know, um, in, in, in Ireland will only have ever heard, you know, the English language spoken with an Irish accent. So when it tries to communicate, it can only use the English language with an Irish accent. Um, Ultra Chunk only knows pictures of me, so that's the way that it, that the way that it expresses itself. So I'll just play you a couple of minutes of this.
They've also noticed that a lot of the songs that are being released at the moment, the chorus appears much earlier in the song than it has ever historically in popular music. Because if the chorus appears earlier, there's something you can actually hang a meme around, and that means it's successful on TikTok. So even if we never open TikTok, it's affecting the way popular music is being written, you know, the time structures that it's organized in, and things like that. Um, so the other sound for me, very now, uh, very much of the moment, is like pretty much pretty solid genre-based music. That, to be honest, if like one of my 18 or 19-year-olds submitted this as a portfolio, I think you're doing a pretty good job. Um, so there's different companies producing pop music, producing film music, um, things like that. And so what I've been doing is sort of taking these pieces which I get generated for me and then adding my voice to them and trying to again feel like what does it feel like to sing with this music like what does it feel like for me to add a song line to sing with it um, it's sort of like it's sort of like a bad boyfriend or something because you sort of feel like I'm really enjoying this though I know it's not good for me um, like, like I shouldn't be enjoying it like, like, like and, and it's coming from my job um, but still I sort of I, I, there's sort of a weird dark rapture I don't know again another German word is necessary to describe that emotion um, so what I thought I'd do is play you as a third example is is um, some of this sort of stuff. So these are super early. These are like just little. I'm, I'm actually playing you like demos rather than finished products, but I thought it would be fun to share those. So um, here's one. about is I say, if you're looking at a system, look what it's training on. 
that like look what was the data set that it was trained on. Um, so I know like Trevor Pagan's recent project about ImageNet is a fantastic project, but he had to go deep into the absolute nerdiest stuff, which was how are those images tagged? Like who who tagged them, what were they paid, all that sort of stuff. So I always say to my students, look at the details, look at the details. So for example, there's a really nice project called Sunspring, um, and it's these guys um, trained a network on all the sci-fi scripts that they could find, and then they pumped out this like five-page long sci-fi film script, and then they shot it. And it's lovely because the actors all commit like it's Gertrude Stein. You, you, you know, they're saying things like, in the future, men will have eyes, you know, and they're all saying it like it's really deeply meaningful. But if you dig into the details, I think almost every single script they trained it on was written by a man. Um, almost every film, um, there are like overwhelmingly white male male leads, you know, stuff like that. So, so with, so you're sort of going, okay, well that shows us a little bit about what culture is right now. But what if we made like a, a gothic sci-fi, you know, corpus? What if we, we sort of went in there? Um, I did one project with where some people in London who have a who have a network said they wanted me to give them text and they trained it on my text archives because I have these huge archives of text. And I said to them, okay, so what's the database, like what's sorry, the data set or the corpus that you use to like, you know, get the system to understand what language is? And they were like, you know, Ovid's Metamorphoses and the Bible. And I was like, what? Do you know? And so so I said, I want to make my own you know, my own corpus. And I spent ages making this gothic feminist corpus with like Edgar Allan Poe and, and like Mary Shelley and, and Donna Haraway and then they're like, it broke the system, you know. And, and so, so, but, but to, to go into those details made me have to engage with it and also made me see how much labor is involved. Do you know what I mean? It's a lot of work to get a data set into shape. So. On the one, on one level, you sort of can't blame people, you know, for using the same, for using ImageNet, for example, over and over, because they're like, hell, it's going to take us like two years and you know, so many thousands and thousands uh, of of euros or dollars to get another data set to train it in. So, so I feel, I feel looking at the details is really important and trying to like, even in the crudest possible way, making your own project. There's lots of software that if you're not terrified of opening up terminal and just like following prompts, you can actually get a net, like a neural net up and running, like even on this computer, you know, and train and train it and sort of see how long it takes to train, how many times you get errors, how you have to keep fixing the data and stuff like that. Maybe I have one more comment because I really like the sense of humor you kind of introduced to the to the field also because I think most of the brain networks produce very funny results. So yeah, yeah. And you can then work with that, which is really great. I, I think I'm interested in it. I was saying earlier today, you know, John Cage loved chance procedures because they, they got him out of his own rut. Um, I was working earlier this week with um, Ulysses, so I, uh, you know, James Joyce, and the very last chapter of Ulysses, I don't know how many of you have read it, it's just this continuous, you know, it's just Molly Bloom talking and talking and talking. And so I was feeding parts of it into the network and letting it auto-complete. You know, and that's just fun, and I get weird text and it shows me what text is made of. So um, I'm very much aware of the biases of the political problems um, and of the fact that, you know, there probably be somebody in this room who is denied a mortgage or denied a rental application or denied a visa um, because of the way that the networks are functioning. I would hope that there will be somebody in this room who maybe needs the love of their life, you know, or somebody in their family, their life is saved because, because of the network. So it's, it's grey, it's not black and white, it's, it's grey and it's a mess. I explain that in just a second. Yeah, yeah. So there's two. I've got two answers to your question. So um, the networks that I've used, I can train text ones on this. You, you know what I mean on my laptop. So for example, in Ireland we have a tradition of folk proverbs. I'm sure you have some here um, where they're all in the Irish language. And it's things like you know, uh, uh, my favourite is a good word never broke anyone's teeth. 
it, you know, it's, you know, like a, a bird in the hand is with two in the bush, these sort of runners, we call them Shannon though in Irish. So I use the network to train and generate new ones. So they're like new, timeless examples of folk, you know, wisdom and stuff like that. Um, at the moment I'm doing a huge project which is taking forever to get started because we're making a massive, massive data set of all the text scores from Fluxus onwards. And we want to use this to, to make new text scores, but Ragnar, my assistant, has to type them in by hand and like format them all, so it's taking forever. So I, I, I go wherever I can and, and use, use whatever I can. The other answer I want to give you, which also goes back to Slavo, so you were saying the technology is moving so fast. You know, how does art keep up with it? And the honest, the honest answer is we can't unless we get a residency at Google. And there's, you know, people have mixed ethical feelings about, you know, even doing that. I'm not saying that as a judgment. You know, it's we can't keep up with the cutting edge because, like the project that Memo and I did, Ocean Children, we co-invested what would have been our fee to buy a machine so that we could keep the project going, you know? And we were lucky, we had the privilege that we were able to do that and we still be okay financially. Um, but just even training the model in the cloud, you, you know, it's like 45 seconds of training time for like 300 quid, you, you know? So it's impossible for us to keep up with what a company like DeepMind is doing. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so my approach, this is the third way, I suppose I would say, is science fiction is that, like one of my favorite writers is William Gibson, is to just try to think it through in your art, even if you can't do it, even if you don't have access to that technology, to think it through. So this is where the big reveal comes, is the piece that I played you last night, um, yes, I was quoting from different papers from Google, I was trying to copy the vocal samples from the WaveNet paper, but none of it was generated using AI. That's why I asked the question, because I have a feeling that you need to meet me Use the material of the numerical complicated way because, for example, the group one is too complex to ever come on the narrow pattern because you kept context over several sentences and then you just can't do it. Yeah. For me, it can't have not been such a way as the, my, my idea with the piece was okay, so I don't have access to all this technology, but I can still think through these issues by making the piece. So it's not a joke, it's not to fool people, it's like a speculative fiction piece, to, you know, to sort of try and ask these questions. So, so sort of, I have my real AI, and I have my speculative AI. So if I did, like, I, I, I really believe in this idea of speculative AI, and the idea of just like imagining things, and thinking them through the same way that a science fiction writer would. Um, there's this William Gibson quote in this fantastic interview he does with Paris Review where he says, you know, and he's talking about 10 years ago and he's saying, look, you know, when 9-11 happened, I was in the middle of writing a book and I went upstairs the morning after 9-11 happened and I just deleted it because I was like, I can't keep writing that book. The world has changed. It's impossible for me to write the same narrative. And as a result of that, the three books that he wrote after 9-11 were all set in the present day. And um, the first one, The Pattern Recognition, one of my favorite books ever. But nobody knows where to stock it in the bookstore. Like, does it go in the regular fiction or does it go in the sci-fi? Because it's like a novel about a cool hunter who's a woman, like set in the present day. How is that sci-fi? And in Paris Review, in this interview, he's saying, if we were to describe the world we live in now to somebody living, say, 20 or 25 years ago, and, and I can even use the example of us living right now, if we were to describe this world to somebody 25 years ago, and we were to say, you know what, everybody has this computer that they carry around in their pocket that lets the government know who they are at all times, you know, and Trump is the president, and the UK wants to leave, and there's this disease that's passed by people having sex, and it's just killing everybody. People would be like, this is too much. Like, just, just have flying cars and like aliens that invade. So, so Gibson talks about, he talks about using the science fiction of myths to handle the hot casserole of the world that we live in. So, so that's, that's, and I know, and I suppose like, okay, if we don't have access to the funding, let's just pretend, you know, like, and, and I do think that's a, that's a, a, a way of, of empowering, you know, so that you can talk about things. So when I talk about the beast, um, I always present it as true, but for me it's basically a science, it's a piece of science, science fiction fiction or spectacle fiction. Anybody else? And you basically asked us to learn the Oh, oh I'm, I'm, that was very efficient. <laughs> like an AI was running my brain. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> all the same time. Faster than real time. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not that cool if you have to say, you know, the final ones. Um, I actually did meet him. Yeah, 
Stanford, but by the music department. And, and then like I went to him and I was like, hey, I'm into this stuff. And he was like, this is, this is cool. You know, I'll see if my students want to do any of it. And he came to one of my shows, so I feel completely justified in thanking him because like, I did meet him. But again, the project that he was doing when I visited Stanford was they were using they were using all the feed from police officers' body cameras, and they were analyzing all the ways that the police officers spoke to white people versus people of color to see, you know, how racist the cops were being and to see the differences. And that's really important work. Like, I'm not going to be like, want to do my art project, Dan? Do you know what I mean? I'm like, no, 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 no. Do the good fight, the good fight with the, the police camera, and, you know, the police body cameras. So, so there are people doing really interesting saving work, you know. Um, so I think it's 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 a very weird field, <laughs> but it's I think it, it's something that um, it's going to affect it's going to affect people's lives increasingly, you know, as we get older. That doesn't mean that you know music will be wiped out. I think such festivals like this will actually be even more important because people will relish being in a room together, like and what that means to be in a room together. And I think that that's, that's, I sort of feel, I sort of feel like, I started noticing a couple of years ago in galleries that there's more ceramics, and my dad's a potter, so I was like, oh, that's raccoon glaze, I actually recognize this, in galleries, and I was talking to a curator in London, and they were saying, yeah, it's this weird thing where you have like super digital stuff, and then you have like woodwork, or ceramics, you know, and the two exist. You know, it, it, like people want both. You know, and and so I think that we're gonna, we may have a lot of be listening to AI generated music every time we're on hold on a phone call, which could make being on hold a lot better. Let's face it. Um, we're certainly going to be served it by Spotify when we log on, and a lot of the videos that we watch will have AI generated music. And I think that also then people will want to come and have experiences together, being people together in a room. Um, because as cool as the AI it can get, it's never going to be the same. Maybe that's a good place to start. Thanks very much.